Good morning. It's 10 o'clock and I see it's time that we get started with our uh, session this morning. Uh, my name is Brad Wheeler. I'm the Vice President for Information Technology and CIO at Indiana University and the Chair of the Quality Foundation Board. I am delighted to be here and delighted to have uh, so many of our colleagues here for this conference. Uh, I think the last head count we saw was about 815 uh, 38 states. I don't know who those 12 misbehaving states are, but uh, 38 states here, six countries, and 157 organizations. It's just really quite enjoyable. And Joanne, you could just see the pride in her eyes as uh, she really was one of the co founders and made the choices at Cornell that uh, got us uh, uh, to this day. Uh, I appreciate the humor of the program committee of scheduling Kowali 101 in room. 101 at the Marriott. I thought that was uh, really appropriate. Uh, we'll speak a little bit about all the things that make Kuali work, and I'll try to move uh, with a, a, a bit of swiftness, but I also really welcome your questions. That's what this session is about. You may observe some things going on, or you wonder, like, you know, how does that get paid for? Where does the money go? I mean, you know, who lets all these people work on this stuff, or, you know, back home? Uh, so we're happy to talk about some of those questions uh, as we go. Uh, the Kuali community really came about in a desire to create an ecosystem. We started with the financial system because that was an immediate issue that those investors wanted to solve. But we did follow a Stephen Covey principle, and that is begin with the end in mind. Where did we want to go over time in creating this community? And there were three big pieces to it that were very important. So first off is the software producers. That's the investors. That's someone who says, our institution needs something to happen, and we're willing to put people in into it, we'll put cash into it, we'll put our functional expertise and design into it, and that is the community of software producers. So that's fairly well understood. But we chose that all of the work products that come out of that community of software producers would be freely shared under an open software license. And I'll speak more to that in a moment. But uh, and by making it freely available, that means there would probably be a much larger community out there of software consumers. And producers, by definition, are consumers or irrational, one of those two, uh, in making their investment to get software that they would like. But there was a really third important piece in this, and this was a big debate back in the early days of Sakai and such, what would be the relationship with the commercial firms? And those of us uh, uh, who were willing to be software producers and willing to share it so others could be consumers, one of the greatest concerns was, you know, how would it be supported? Who would take care of it? You know, would the phone ring and then you would be overburdened, and it, particularly if you shared it with your friends, you know they are going to call you uh, it, with support. And so we created in that ecosystem a role for commercial affiliates. And when Kuali was formed, uh, it was an important decision. Uh, commercial affiliates are members, dues paying members of the foundation. They vote just like universities are members of the foundation. Uh, we talk through that. There's no short chairs or second class status in doing this. And that's a little bit of a change for some of us who have come from a buyer-vendor relationship where it's almost an adversarial process of negotiating a contract which turns out to be 87 pages of which 86 you don't understand uh, very well. And so it was a change to say, wait a minute, are you letting the fox inside the hen house? Well, that's not really what's going on here at all because the open license is the protection that we all have, the commercial firms and the institutions have in making this work. So this is really the heart of what Kuali set out to be. And more than anything, we are a values-driven community. And those values are really about solving problems for our institutions and believing that if this community can understand its values and everyone act in enlightened self-interest, as Joanne mentioned this morning, that really it raises all boats, that we all benefit uh, tremendously from that. 
The foundation does a very few things, and I'll speak to it in uh, just a moment. There are a few things that are kind of immutable, though, that are not really up for debate. Uh, I'll say, I'll, I'll illustrate this, but we the, have decided the action is in the projects, not necessarily in this big foundation that is the opposite, you know, just the open source version of a Oracle or an SAP. The, the real action is in the projects themselves. We have a consistent license. That's not really up for debate. Uh, projects have to have a charter. We have to know who's running the project, how do decisions get made, you can't just have a, you know, a Java dude and a dudette decide to throw some code up there and all of a sudden we've got a Kowali project. That, that's not how it works at all. That's what SourceForge is for, if you want to put something uh, o over there. We know that the brand has to have trust and confidence. So the foundation manages finances very carefully. There is fund-based accounting. You know, in the earliest of days, when the Research Administration Committee, Kowali Coeus, when that project was forming, they would go, oh my gosh, I don't know if we can put our finances there. That financial system is a much bigger project and we don't want those CFOs running off with our money. Uh, so that's not how it works at all. They're, each project has a separate fund that their charter and their board decide how that money is used. And uh, we're very, very careful about authorizing use of the Kuali brand. I'm a business school guy. Uh, a brand is trust. You know, that really matters. So we try to be careful where that brand goes because it affects everyone. Uh, software licenses are a very important matter and they get glossed over uh, a lot. Sometimes you read about a company or something out there, so, oh, this is open source. Well, just because you make up a license and slap some words on it and call it open source, that does not really make it open source. There is the good housekeeping seal of open source, and that is the Open Source Initiative, or OSI, in defining what is open source and what is not. And in our view, it takes three things to make one of these communities work, and that really is code. you got to have some code that really is the good stuff, and you got a license attached to it. How are you going to coordinate amongst each other, and what are the values of the community? So Google <laughs> makes the Android operating system available under open source. But Google has been severely criticized that that's not really open source in that Google keeps the coordination and the community behind the Google commercial wall. And they spit out code every so often. And it is open source if you want to run off and do something. But there's almost no way for you to contribute back to it or for the community to prioritize some of the things that happen next. So this is no criticism of Google. They're doing brilliant things. But the open source initiative, OSI, some people have said, sure, you're meeting the code or the license part, but you're not really building an open source community in the ways that these things can be sustained. Google could make a dictatorial decision about Android in ways that differ in no way from Oracle or Microsoft in the way that it's being managed uh, right now. Software licenses also vary in a couple of other points. So first of all, are they approved by the Open Source Initiative? Uh, we have battled two licenses through the Open Source Initiative and it is almost easier to get something approved by the UN Security Council. Um, they are not in any mood to approve anything about licensing. They are in the mood to shoot licenses right now and reduce the number of them for very good reason. But we uh, did work our way through that. Chris Coppola, who is uh, on the foundation board, he's uh, with RSmart, uh, worked that very hard. That's a great example of a commercial firm helping the entire community in working that license approval through. The second thing to know about open source licenses are they essentially fall very quickly into one, two sides of the aisle. And one side of the aisle is what you hear of as GPL, uh, kind of license, which is a great software license and a great lineage and history. That license is known as a viral license or copy left. And the, the simple point there is that the freedom for what happens with that software code vests in the code itself. So that software is freely available to be used 
Um, you can take it anywhere. But it is viral in that if you use that code and you add your own code to it, your code must take the rules of that license. So the software code itself, the rights vest with it, and it is a, one way of saying it is the grandparents controlling the behavior of the grandchildren from the grave. Because once you start putting and mixing in viral code, that is very much its intent is the code will always be free. You cannot take it, productize it, and take it away from the world uh, if you're going to distribute. The other approach to software licensing is the rights vest with the decision maker, the user downstream. So Kuali has chosen an open, open license, as we call it sometime, or non-viral, and there are tremendous merits to both paths. I, I can stand here and argue either path. But the approach we have taken is that all the quality code is out there and you can take it. If you want to take it and put it into a commercial product and shrink wrap it and go sell it for $29.95, God bless you. Do what you want. You want to mix it in with your code? Great. You get to make choices about how the quality code is used or not used or mixed or commercialized or shared that is left uh, to you down the way. Now some would say, are you guys idiots in doing this and making this completely open to open? Uh, we have said that the foundation always intends to be the price leader in the availability of our code. <laughs> so to the extent that someone commercializes it and is able to sell it, what they are really doing is offering value add on top of the code. And that's worth paying for. If it's installation routines, if it's integration code to something else, if it's shrink wrapped and bundled, you know, the Linux operating system is freely available out there. But Red Hat made a gazillion dollars packaging it, supporting it, uh, putting uh, installation routines in, and doing that. So the license we use is the Educational Community License 2.0. For all practical purposes, it is the Apache license with one clause removed that would have caused your attorney's heartburn and that is on patent warranty and I spent two and a half days in a lawyer with lawyers in a room working through the details of this and if you ever have anyone like a tech transfer officer you know say wait a minute what's our, our institution we're writing software code and we're giving it away shouldn't we be selling that I have a very nice document for you to refer them to uh, after this summit, we had Stanford's lawyers there, MIT's lawyers there, the Mellon Foundation. We had folks from the UK, from uh, Australia. I had our lawyers. I had our tech transfer officers. Michigan was there. It was one of those summits that it was either going to work or somebody was probably going to kill it somebody. Um, so we really have worked this out, and I'm happy to share that with anyone who likes. It's a public document. Uh, it's posted at Educause and, and other places. We use the term open source a lot to talk about the software license and that the code can be shared. But you also hear Kuali is community source. So what does that really mean? I mean, is there, is there a difference in that? Uh, Eric Raymond wrote a brilliant and a truly brilliant short essay called The Cathedral and the Bazaar. If you've not read it, it's short. Google it. You can find it. It's, it's available out there. The Cathedral and the Bazaar. And these were contrasting two models of software production. So in the cathedral, you would think of a typical hierarchical company, whether it's Microsoft or you know, Oracle or, or whomever, and they set a budget and they set a plan and they hire people and there's a project manager and they make decisions. They may talk to the users out there, but they come back inside the firm and they make decisions. That is the production model of software known as the cathedral. Whereas the alternative is the bazaar. It's messy. People are yelling. People sometimes aren't listening. Uh, there's offers and, and such. And that's just the messiness of the bazaar. And in a brilliant book called The Success of Open Source, uh, a Berkeley political science professor uh, wrote, he said, you know, when you look at all of the theory in computer science, and it says if you're going to build a really complicated system and it's got a lot of interactions with each other and it's got to work at very, very fast performance and big scale and all, 
you need the cathedral to make it work. You can't do big, complicated software in a model called the bazaar. <coughs> but yet, when the theory no longer matches the data, it's time to reassess the theory. Because the Linux operating system is a level of complexity far beyond anything we're doing here. And it is thriving. As you know, you're all running Linux in your data centers uh, in various places. The Apache web server totally killed all the other web servers out there, and it was open source. So uh, in, in his book, uh, The Success of Open Source, he asked, how did this happen? And so for us, is in knowing all of this coming into it, when we think about these models of software production, if I'm Joanne DeStefano and I'm putting in a financial system and I'm telling my trustees, we're going to keep our financials the critical record, the $3 billion spent at Cornell, and it's going to be on an open system, I'd like to know how that thing is going to be maintained over time. And, you know, there was worries like, oh, wow, or, you know, funny-looking people who are crazy committing software changes from, you know, foreign countries by dark of night for my critical system. And our answer is, well, they may be funny-looking if you actually meet all of them. But, you no, know, there's actually a process for how that gets done. So we refer to community source as this hybrid model that the software license itself is open. That's what we said, software consumers. We make it available to the world. But the model of producing, we draw a lot from uh, the, uh, the cathedral. We have a plan for how things are done. We know what the investment is. The community knows this feature is going to be in the next release. And sorry, but that feature just didn't make this cut. The community values it, but until there are resources, that next one is not going to be there. So we sometimes refer to community source, you know, is the pub between the cathedral and the bazaar, where people really go to work things out and get things done. So that's how we think of ourselves as community source. The software products are open source by every tradition, by every definition of the word but we use a work style that is a bit more similar to the cathedral. And if there's one bit of secret sauce that makes the Kuali stew taste good and, and work, um, my view is it's this lightweight coordination, a few values that we don't want to violate, and we have found a way to balance this tension between severable property. So if you want, you can go grab any of the software code and run away with it. And in the case of research administration or financials, two of our more mature projects, you know, there are millions, millions of dollars that have gone into those. And you can go walk away with those for free. But the reward for doing so is you have to maintain them and patch them and take care of them. And so you have this tension that pulls you back into collaboration because you'd like to pick up the innovation that others are doing or the patches that come along or the enhancements. And this lightweight tension between the severability of knowing if that community ever failed, if Kuali just imploded, you can walk away with that software. You cannot say that if your current vendor just got acquired by someone else, plans to kill the product line and uh, use a pitchfork to encourage your migration uh, to a product that perhaps you did not want. So this is a very important part of what makes this work. Joanne Stefano, she probably would have loved to just write a small check, had a vendor come in, slap in a brilliant new financial system, and off they go. But the world just doesn't work that way. She needed a system that worked for Cornell without having to build a bunch of shadow systems around it or worry about what was going to happen with the lineage of that code. Because that code could be taken away from her over time. Uh, the cloud presents an interesting comment, and I'll speak to that in just a moment. The Economist has written three times, look, and that is a bastion of capitalism. Again, a business school professor, I love The Economist. The, you know, the, the Economist has written three times, beware the cloud. It is the next form of vendor lock-in. But it is even more heinous. Because right now, I, we run uh, PeopleSoft Financials or Oracle Finance, or I'm sorry, uh, HR and Student. If we got crossways with Oracle, we have the code. We could keep using it while our lawyers had discussions. 
you know, we could at least keep moving forward. In the cloud, they can turn it off. They can just turn it off if you really got to legal blows with each other. And you can say, well, I have a contract that says they can't do it. Well, why don't you stand outside and recite that as you're having legal problems and they've turned it off? You know, so, and what happens when they buy and sell each other or what happens when you want out? So I've heard people say, oh, the cloud, the cloud, the cloud. Well, the cloud is a moment for us to, to, to have a pause and think about how we want to do things together, aggregated um, at scale. So let's dig in just a little bit to the foundation and the projects uh, themselves. Uh, first, I'll talk about the Kuali Foundation. And we had a really important meeting, and I've forgotten what year it is. I'm going to make this up. Maybe it was about 2007. That's what I wrote down on here. Um, Kuali started off as financials, and then another project of investors came together and said, let's do research. Kuali Coeus. And well, in between there, there was this thing called Rice, because they both needed that. And, you know, then Kuali student rang, and, you know, well, here we go. And, and so there was this thought that we were going to build this organization, maybe, that we would have a, a legal entity. Kuali is a legal foundation, separate board, separate entity, separate from any of our institutions. By the way, the members of the Kuali Foundation Board, they serve as private citizen. I am private citizen Brad on the board of the foundation. If I left tomorrow to go work for the University of Wyoming, no change. That is not the Indiana seat or the Michigan seat. That is, that is uh, me and all the good and ill that that means for my own responsibilities in doing so. So we had this conversation in doing that, and you know, we said, you know, this is just not the kind of organization and community that we want. Those first thoughts were really, we rejected that idea. And we said, what we really need is small foundation, big projects. The expertise is in the projects. The people who have to implement the, the student system or implement the library system, they care about it working for the library system. They don't really care about everything else out there uh, and all. So we said we need strong finance and boards around a project management in each of the projects. And what we need is rather than each project standing out there making up its own, creating its own uh, uh, collaboration infrastructure, its own code distribution, trying to manage its own finance, trying to have a separate brand, we'll just have a little shared services unit in the middle. So if, if you pause for a moment, just think about the wonder of this. And uh, I may not have all the numbers right, but this is, is roughly true. Uh, we're somewhere around 70 million cumulative total investment in Kuali that was actually signed, that institutions said, I will put this developer in, I will put this functional person in uh, over time. It's across all of the projects. Uh, you know we have 800 here. There are over about 1,500 on the Kuali All Hands distribution list. There are 175 community distribution lists in Kuali, and it is coordinated by four staff at the foundation. The foundation and its audited financials is almost 30 million in net assets, and now that includes. Uh, people who are committed, and then we charge those off over time as receivables by doing the accounting right. So pause for a moment and think about what you have accomplished. We're essentially using the internet for lightweight coordination and getting the expertise and the decisions as close as possible to where those people are. There is no big board up there that says, Sorry, research administration, you don't get your features because we need to put it into the product line of the finance system. That's not how it works. The research administration people, they pool their resources, they set their plans, and they execute for their needs. <coughs> Likewise, there are more variances among these projects than most of you know or understand. I have the, just the lovely fortune of being in a role to work on uh, amongst a lot of these. And the, the, by having a few things that are immutable with the foundation, you don't get to pick your own license, you don't get to manage your own bank account, I mean, or we'll have the bank account, but you can manage your cash. Um, what that allows us to do is let each community adapt to what works best for their community. The way the librarians want to do things, if you know anything about the open library environment, 
They want to design that system, but they did not want to put the developers forward. So we did an open bid, and the software development has been offshore. That's how they wanted to manage it. Financial doesn't do it that way. Uh, mobility ran literally from first announcement to release in about two months and brought some partners on. I mean, each of these projects works for its community. So the foundation itself, you can read the list here, it provides a few narrow functions that all of the projects need. And so this is a brilliant uh, outcome of your work that we can have a small coordinated entity among so many uh, uh, investors. As I recall, last count, 72 different organizations had invested in one of the Kuali projects. So this approach to lightweight coordination and a foundation that's able to do these things has really been quite remarkable. Now, the, the font on this is probably too small for you, but you notice the organization of this diagram trying to represent, you know, koala land, as we call it, koala land. And that is, you see the seven projects across the top, the foundation, the governance, you know, each of these projects has a charter, it has a board, we know who the development teams are, subject matter experts, and then there's this thing down here, the eighth project, uh, technically the third one if you want to count by height, uh, it is RICE because RICE provides common services for all of them. So each of those pieces of software doesn't have to rewrite workflow or rewrite common things that they all need. So that means they save money up there by using RICE. RICE is balanced by what the Technology Roadmap Committee says, where middleware is going, and the Applications Roadmap Committee, what do these guys need? And then undergirding that is the brand and the legal entity of the foundation itself. And that's how we like to think about it. We, uh, again, we have four members of the Kuali Foundation. And I think it's just amazing that we've learned how to coordinate all this stuff amongst ourselves with a very lightweight overhead of managing the foundation. So how does a Kuali project start? You know, where do little Kuali projects come from? You know, to ask that question. Uh, projects typically go through a few stages, and so this all looks pretty familiar to those of us who've been through this uh, a few times, that institutions say there is a common need, uh, just like mobility being an example. We can all agree, our universities and colleges, we need to connect the things the university does to handheld devices. In that world of handheld devices, you got a trillion dollars of capital and Nokia and Microsoft and Google and Apple bet on marching those devices forward. Do you really think students are not going to want to be able to change classes on a handheld device that you're going to say, oh, no, no, you got to go connect to an Ethernet, enable a computer somewhere? Not going to happen. So we got to reach out and do that. So how do these projects come about? Well, a common needs identified and people start having a discussion. Well, what should it do? You know, how would it work? Who needs to be involved? How fast can we get it together in, in some way? And then it really goes in this incubation stage. And that's kind of the, the fuss, cuss, and discuss, and cuss again, and usually, uh, to figure that out. Uh, as that starts to mature, you got all these people looking like, well, I'm kind of thinking about investing, but my institution isn't sure. And it starts to sound like a game of musical chairs. That someone says, well, I'm in, and I'm in. And I'm in, and the group starts to go, okay, I think we've about got enough people in. There's one more chair open and four people walking around. Someone's reaching for the record needle, for those of you who recall what that means. Um, uh, that, you know, it's just, it's time. And so you've got an investment group, and that really is the big line, the big, what should be read there, a uh, big project line. So that group of investors goes head down, and that's where we sometimes talk about the golden rule that those who bring the gold make the rules. Uh, because we have learned over time that people who don't bring the gold trying to make decisions and impose them on those who do bring the gold, that doesn't work very well. So that's why we talk about the golden rule. But again, subject to immutables, the work products are going to be shared, all of the other things that we've said before. So we create a board, a functional council, like Joanne talked about. The functional people need to say how something's going to work. So for RICE, RICE is very technical stuff, and that's where we need very technical people making decisions. 
Uh, for the library software, for OL OLE, the librarians need to be the ones saying what the functional uh, guidance will be. And then we have to decide sometime is it time to expand. Uh, I think invariably, in every Kuali project that has been announced, once it got mobilized, additional investors came in. And they came in and they go, we acknowledge the work that's been done, we think the direction you are going is right, and we want to come in and add resources and take a seat at the table as this moves forward. You don't get to come in and say, I want to re-debate the last two years. Um, that, that just doesn't work. So that's how a project builds and expands, and then ultimately there's a, a, a phase where there's enhancement, sustaining, and integration, and you move beyond it. Only half, and maybe not even completely half, of the Kuali projects have had investment from the Mellon Foundation. Uh, I think three, three or four have. The rest of them we've done on our own, that we have built those projects ourselves. So to take a quick look at something I could probably talk for almost an hour about, this is generally what that big roadmap uh, looks like of all these projects. And I see I didn't quite get all the animation caught up because I tried to uh, illustrate these. Uh, that is the big chessboard across Kuali. So you see the calendar at the bottom, the gold uh, badges, that's where Mellon put some money in. We, we said, and Mellon has been a minor investor, essential, I mean, uh, just brilliant in helping us. But the universities have always been the major investors, and more recently, we are seeing commercial firms come in just like the University of X or Y that they put money into the investment even though they have no claim on the IP, the intellectual property, uh, beyond anyone else. The, the red uh, ones that you see there, if you imagine that color is red, uh, that would be where we made our own investment without Mellon funds. And you see release one, release two, release three, kind of the gold releases moving along. So you can see how this has grown from just the first project to the second to the third as the time went along and we extended the model of universities pooling our resources. So how, pray tell, do you coordinate all this stuff? And I don't mean within a project because we kind of understand project management and functional design, but across all of Kuali, how do you coordinate all of this? I mean, I can say that, answer that really in one word. It's called Jennifer. But um, beyond Jennifer and uh, her team, we have a, a couple of meetings a year. Uh, one is Kuali Days, and that is our big public meeting. We welcome the tire kickers, uh, people who are in the project, the skeptics, you know, media, whomever. Everybody come to talk about uh, what's going on across Kuali. In the second one, though, which is usually in the spring, that's the Kuali Workshop. And the Kuali Workshop is really just all the projects having the work meetings they need to face to face and we just happen to schedule them all beside each other and that takes about four days now uh, the way things work out and all the concurrency of it we usually have a couple of sessions where we all come together but that's really again lightweight coordination is the approach of the quality foundation so why be a member why would any rational person invest money and membership dues of the Kuali Foundation when the work products are available anyway for free. You do get to vote in the elections if you are a member of the Foundation. But the main reason is it just puts you closer into the flow of information, into the community, and it is, you know, pure, pure self-interest might say, I'm just going to sit on the side and take everything. But we understand the tragedy of the commons that uh, in, in the purest sense of that, without some social rules applied back, then ultimately the commons evaporates. So that's where we move from self-interest to enlightened self-interest. Uh, for smaller dues than many of our institutions pay to organizations that accomplish far less, uh, this keeps the commons uh, going. And I think this may, I've, I've given up on keeping this slide up to date, but these are the members of the foundation. Uh, it's about 55 now or so. Jennifer said the number this morning, and it just continues to grow. Uh, we made a choice uh, at Cornell, at a meeting at Cornell, what would the price structure for being a member of the foundation be? And we debated many models. There's a lot of ways of thinking about that, and it is painful. 
but we've made the choice to tie an in institutional membership dues to the size of the budget of the institution. So receipts, all sources. Money from your endowment, money from research grants, money from tuition, money from state. What are the total receipts for your organizations? And very large institutions should pay more, and very small institutions should pay less. And so it's scaled from $5,000 to $25,000 a year to be a member of the foundation. And uh, that pricing structure seems to have worked pretty well so far in being fair to everyone. So we've spoken a little bit on uh, the commercial affiliates, and you heard Joanne say quite clearly, there is work to be done for our institutions to succeed with these systems that sometimes goes beyond local abilities or our ability to help each other out just a little bit. So I'm delighted to say that we made that bet that if we provided an open, open, non-viral license, which gave the commercial affiliates confidence that if they take that code and want to mix it with some of their own routines and such, they wouldn't have to give all their code away. That's one of the main reasons we chose that path. And you can see it has developed a healthy ecosystem of uh, uh, commercial affiliates and eThority being the most recent, the last one in the door for this week, uh, though I've had conversations in the hallway, uh, of 10 commercial affiliates right now. Some of you have read over time um, some of the things I've, I've had time to write about open source and more of that was around the 2005-2007 uh, time frame and I'm pleased to see really it's your behavior that's making a lot of that stuff come true. But of all the stuff I ever wrote down or any presentation I ever gave, if there's one thing to read, it's called the inevitable unbundling of software and support. I mean, it was the second thing I wrote. It was when Sakai was in diapers. I wrote it about February or March of 2004. You can find it on the web. Go to my homepage. You can find it. It's a short piece that just said, instead of licensing a piece of software and then having to pay maintenance at whatever price a vendor set forevermore, if we open up the intellectual property, we can have the, the software freely available, or you can get it from a commercial firm, and then you can buy support as you need it, a la carte, from any firm or do it yourself or change firms. They can't take the IP away from you. And that's what we see in this is the inevitable unbundling of software and support. <coughs> there is a market out there for smart, hardworking, capitalist firms to make money while participating deeply as equal peers in the Kuali Foundation. And with that, I'm happy to welcome your uh, questions for anything you want to know about Kuali, and I'll, I'll tell you my, uh, my understanding of it. Surely there's a question out there somewhere, something you really wanted to know but have never had anyone uh, say it. Uh, the, the question, um, would it currently now in situation in the world, um, how do you see it affect um, Kohali, and how does that differ from how the economy affects commercial firms like the, Oracle and so on? Yeah, the question is, with the current state of the world economy, and I'm not sure the health of Italy is at this moment, uh, how does this affect Kohali and where we're going and how is that similar or dissimilar to the fortunes for commercial firms that are operating in this time? Uh, I, I would separate it into the category of how that is favorable towards the, the, the role of Kuali and how it is unfavorable towards the role of Kuali. So in the way that it is favorable, I believe the evidence is mounting for rational minds to look at it and reach the conclusion that Kuali costs less. In this period, Kuali costs less. It was a fair question just when we wrote the software. You could say, yeah, but implementation is implementation. It still costs a lot of money to implement, even if there's not a big cost with the license. The evidence is mounting. You can put this stuff in less expensively than other uh, approaches. The community sharing, as Joanne talked about this morning, the recycling and reuse people who have implemented, they go, oh, yeah, here's all our stuff. You know, you don't have to go buy it from someone for $150 an hour to recreate it uh, for you. So I think those are the one of the factors that's favoring it. 
the idea of not being in this stupid game of licensing where, oh no, you only have 75,000 seats and this year you have 75,053 FTE, so you owe us a quarter million dollars. I mean, what an idiotic model for buyers. I mean, it's brilliant for sellers. So I think some of these things are factors that are favoring it. What, what are the unhealthy aspects that are uh, not favoring Kowali? Um, a commercial firm says, we have a contract, and if you don't pay, you don't get to keep using the software. So there's a toll booth, and you can't drive forward unless you drop off your money. With Kowali, we work on the investments from the community, and someone could choose not to invest. There's no toll booth. You can continue to drive on through if you want. And I think that is in our institution's best interest. But that stands on the assumption of enlightened self-interest in making that work over time. We have not seen much melt, to be honest. Very, very, very little melt. That's because most of our, a melt of resources, because most of our institutions who have taken this path, they understand that this is a path. And the enlightened part, they know continuing to put in these investments make it work. And by and large, those institutions know that if this didn't work, they would be put back into a game that would cost them even more. So, so far, I think we're doing fine uh, on that. I think the factors that favor more migration to Kuali vastly exceed the factors that concern me right now particularly in other parts of the world. I know you're from South Africa and open source and being able to take cost out of systems through sharing code and work. I mean, it's a brilliant part of things that are going on in Africa, somewhat in Europe. Uh, I think those things are all positive. Uh, I will be candid. I think there is one more thing that is a, a great concern to us. Uh, the firms who are out there that are making a lot of money in the old software model where things were tens of millions of dollars, they have no trouble spending uh, their fortunes on sales forces and lobbying at the trustee level, at the executive level, spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and outright lying in some case. I'll just say it plainly. So that is a problem if our executives <laughs> choose to be influenced by the FUD rather than the CFO of Cornell literally betting her professional reputation to take Cornell this way forward, or my president standing up tomorrow and saying this is the right thing to do and we ought to be doing more of it. I see that the uh, city of Bloomington is involved. How'd that happen? How's it working? And do you see more outside of higher ed? Yeah, the city of Bloomington uh, had any, anything that is a not-for-profit in terms of an organization the needs for not-for-profits are somewhat similar to higher ed. They don't have a student system, but they have to manage people, they need to do fund-based accounting, things like that. We continue to get literally inquiries every month. I think it's fair to say every month. Uh, some of the city, county governments would like to come together like the universities have. Use our model. Could they replicate the Kowali approach for some of the software they need? And there's been one, one of them took a formal study. Could we take Kowali Financial? import it over to city county because we do fund based accounting uh, as well. So I, I think those entities, um, they have a little less agility than universities, uh, greater bureaucracy in how they make decisions, but I expect over the decade more interest to grow from things that are also generally public sector in the model and the software. I think you could take KFS and literally have a, a city county module or service pack that you add on to it afterwards that would make it work for a lot of those institutions. The city county of San Francisco, um, I, I may not have all the numbers exactly right, but uh, the former CIO there said their quotes to change out their financial system were almost a billion dollars. Just, I mean, it's antiquated, lots of problems, there's a million things going on there. You can imagine they would like to find a better alternative than that. On that same line, has there been interest in K-12? through, 12? K through uh, The question is, has there been interest in K-12? through 12? We've had some interest in K-12. through 12. There are some things that could port there very easily. Kuali Mobility, you could pick that up and take it anywhere. Like you see what the guys did for the conference with the mobile app? You know, anybody running a conference that you've got essentially content about the conference and pump it out, that's pretty uh, uh, 
e easy, easy way to get there. We've had more interest in K through 12 on the Sakai side around teaching and learning software and, and the successor to that project called the Open Academic Environment. But we get calls all the time from things that are public sector. Uh, Matt, the, my question is, the, uh, the, when you establish a project, and the, uh, it seems like the decision making is slow down the project. How do you proceed to do better that in the future? I, I think that's true. The question is, when you establish a project, it seems like once you get into that next phase, the decision making slows down. Uh, having you know participated on many of these and awaited the outcomes for us to install, that is really, really true. I, I find right now that is no different than a very uh, uh, difficult commercial implementation we have going on around uh, CRM. It's a great company that we're working with, but getting to where we want to go, it just always seems slower than we, than we want. Uh, I do think it is within our own means, and each project sets its own project board, its own rules for its functional council, and how it's going to do things. Um, those are choices within our hands if we want to try to dictate uh, them to be differently. The number one thing that is the challenge here, frankly, is resources. Uh, my colleague Barry Walsh often talks about the reality triangle. What all do you want a system to do? When do you want it to do it? And how much resource have you got? And you only get to pick two of those. And often we would like things to happen quickly. We would like them to be ginormous in their beautiful functions and capabilities, but our purse is often limited. And so if we have to solve for purse, then we have to give on one of the other two points. We're usually not willing to give on their functional capabilities. And so what you see is time sometimes takes it. And the way to solve that is to ramp down our appetite or ramp up our purse. That's where additional investors come in make a huge difference. The other thing I will point out, and I don't know if Michael's going to say this tomorrow or not, but I do remind my colleagues sometimes. So I gave you some numbers. There's 800 people here. You know, over the, since inception across eight projects, there's something like $70 million that has gone into a variety of these projects. And all. that all sounds really good, and that sounds like big numbers. That is the shillings and the half pences that fall from the edge of the table for what higher ed invest in these big systems and software. If you take just within the United States alone, much less adding Europe and Africa and Australia, it would truly be a penny out of a dollar that our institutions are putting into these systems. If we accomplished all of this together in a road that was ill-determined where it would go, but it was vision and people buying in and aligning their values and the behavior. If we did all of this for a penny or two, what would happen if someone actually gave us a nickel or a dime? You can see what's possible. And I think that remains our real uh, means to solve some of the pace that we would like some of the projects to go faster. Brad, can you talk a little bit about the options for hosting versus hosted solutions, where the cloud comes into play? commercial solutions versus any educational type things that are going on? Yeah, I, I do not have uh, the final insights to what my president plans to talk about tomorrow, but it's possible he may raise that point. He has rather strong views on the matter. So I'll foreshadow my own views in some of our conversations. Uh, I believe in multi-campus aggregation. Shell Wagner, the CIO at Berkeley, and I wrote a piece uh, two years ago called Above Campus Services. Uh, shaping the promise of cloud computing for higher ed. So the fact of every institution running these systems uh, on their own, I do not believe that holds over the decade. Uh, Internet 2 is lighting up a big new network, an 8.8 .8 terabit network in capacity, 100 gig circuits coming up. Uh, they're demoing them right now at a uh, supercomputing conference in Seattle. So if we've got massive pipes among our institutions, aggregation into larger data centers and cloud, if you want to call it that, uh, I think is inevitable for many of us. It economically will make sense. The question is, under what terms do we want that to happen? So if it's ideal with proprietary software from my home, at my home institution to I lose even more control 
to renting proprietary software in the cloud, I think that is an egregiously bad direction. I think it will bite a lot of people as those firms are bought and sold over the coming years. And the path to get there is we've got big pipes among our institutions. We know how to either own data centers or rent them. Internet2 has just done that with their Net Plus services, a rental deal from HP and a company called SHI. It's a brilliant deal if you've not seen it. You need cycles and, and storage. It's kind of like Amazon doing the, you know, the cloud-based stuff in Amazon. But why don't we take the Kuali software ourselves, make it multi-tenant and put it in the cloud. We can hire some commercial firms to run it as we need. And as long as they behave, everything is great. If they misbehave, move them aside. Have somebody else run it. If the firm running the cloud software owns the rights to all that software and can take it away from you, then I believe we personally are fools for heading down that direction other than to solve a, a, you know, a temporal problem that we need to get through. So I have strong views on that. Catch me at the reception. Barry. Uh, Brad, one of the most common questions that we get, and it goes to my colleague's comment over here about decision-making slowing down. Could you perhaps share John Norman's collaboration map idea about the loss of efficiency and why, why that loomed early? What yeah, uh, so the question is, um, what can we do about improving some decision-making speed and, and how does collaboration work uh, with this? My colleague John Norman at uh, the University of Cambridge in the UK uh, is the one who first said this, but I'll even go back further. As a doctoral student studying group uh, decision making, you hope that you put a group together and you have process gains. You have some unique ideas and I have some unique expertise and you know something, and so one plus one plus one ought to produce you know, synergy. Do I get a four or a five out of it? But no, I have to actually listen to you for a bit and then I have to realize that what you said was not completely idiotic and you know, you have process losses. Often groups don't get synergy. Frankly, they, they lose. So does that mean in quality, when we come together to collaborate, if you put in your two and I put in my two, do we get five or six? No, by and large, we often get three. But if I put in two and I get three, I can live with that. You know, that's a better deal. If it's two and two and two and two, and I get back four or five, and I only put in two, I can live with it not being eight or twelve. And that's where the math actually works. And that's where, to the question over here about pace, pace is really not that hard when you've got sufficient resources for your appetite. When your appetite is large and your resources are modest, that's where pace sometimes bogs down uh, a bit. I mean, we can have functional and dysfunctional processes in how we communicate with each other and make decisions. You know, sometimes we get the wrong person leading, and we need to say that's not really the person's skills. We need to get somebody else in a role, and so we know how to correct that. But by and large, uh, resources are the best way to solve the pace problem. Uh, let's take one more question here. Who does that? Who makes the decision to change out the project? Uh, that would be back in the projects themselves. The projects, <coughs> each project has a charter that says who the board is. Usually it is investors. Uh, or if it's in a sustainability phase, like quality financial already exists. So it really has people who are investing in the sustainability of it, and they're on that board. Most problems, uh, and I can say with lots of participation, very few things ever really come up to the boards, per se, of the project. Most things get dealt with at the functional council level, or at the technical council level, or occasionally something will come up to the board. But by the charter, there is a means when those decisions uh, have to be made, and we've, we've had them made multiple times on projects over the years. Uh, I'll hang around for a moment, then I'm dashing off to something, as I suspect many of you are too. Uh, I hope this is helpful for you, as you may be explaining this back home, we'll make the slides available, and just thank you for being at Kowali Days, work the hallways, talk to a lot of people, I hope you have a great conference.